Good morning, church. I'm going to try very, very, very hard to um, deliver this message with a little bit of levity and lightness and uh, not divulge into more emotional outbursts. God help me. Um, let me just take a moment and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your love for us and that your passion for our lives, your passion for our souls are so evident in your word, Lord, and um, I thank you, Lord. I, I pray that your spirit would be with us, teach us, Lord, um, allow us to understand and comprehend the passion that you have for each one of us and those that have, who have yet to understand, those who are, have yet to embrace your love, Lord. Uh, we pray that you would allow us to reach those people who are lost. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen. So every year um, during Christmas, specifically starting in December, December 1st, I turn off the radio. I don't listen to radio, particularly because my wife would always set it to K-Love or some Christian station, and, you know, and most of the time I'll be driving in the car and, you know, like, you know, the song, the, the, the Christmas shoe would come up, you know, and I'll start bawling, you know, and then people driving by would be like, oh, my God, he must have gone through something dramatic. But they don't know that it's just a song that I listen on the radio, you know, like they thought, like, I've, like, lost my entire life or something like that, you know, something dramatic happened. And it's like, I don't want to give people the false impression. And also, it's very dangerous. Like, I don't want to be a danger to myself or to the other people around me when I drive, you know. But every single time that song comes up, um, I don't know. It's just a sentiment. There's, a, there's an emotion that um, is somewhere written in that song that, I don't know, it's just gripping. It's kind of like remembering back when um, I was younger and we all was uh, watching this movie called The Champion, right? I don't know why we do this so to ourselves. We watch the movie The Champion and then, you know, sitting there and just bawling at the end when, you know, that, that boy was like calling out to his dad who, you know, was a boxer and he died in the ring and, you know, we just, and he's just like keep on calling out for his dad and then we're all just like, oh my God, why are we doing this to ourselves, you know? It's like pass the popcorn, oh my God, and pass the tissue. I, I don't know why, you know. So I have made it a point in my life to turn off the radio uh, December 1st. I try very, very hard to not listen to the radio. Anyways, this past uh, two weeks ago, um, uh, you know, I did the same thing, except I, you know, took on an assignment as a delivery boy for a uh, wooden back there. You know, he ordered some stuff from Ikea, and he asked me, you know, hey, can you go and uh, pick it up? And I was like, okay, I'll do it. And it's, you know, it's in Palo Alto, so it's quite far away. Not really, <laughs> but I don't drive anywhere. I don't go anywhere anymore, so, you know, it's quite far from me. So I was just sitting in, in the car, and, you know, it's a really silent. It was really quiet. So I, I got to turn on the radio. <laughs> so, but then, you know, I, I turn away from the K-Love station, and then um, I dial into uh, NPR. And when I got to NPR, um, uh, there was a, a, a story, a very interesting story that was, that was playing. Um, they talk about, uh, they had an interview with uh, Rob Delaney. I don't know if, if anybody who not knows who that is. I don't know who that is, but now I kind of know a little bit about him. So Rob Delaney is a, um, is com a comedian, and he is apparently written like um, a couple of seasons of this really popular um, comedy uh, series on TV. And uh, they were interviewing him, so they're like, comedy, you know, this, 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 is, this is good, because you know, I get to laugh instead of crying. But then uh, you know, it talks about you know, some of the hardship that he went through as his um, TV success was, uh, was happening. He's, he and his wife and his, their family was living in, um, in, uh, in the UK uh, currently. That's where the show is being filmed. And he talks about um, Henry, uh, his son, uh, 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 and anyways, um, so they had um, uh, they had Henry, and at around one year old, um, he started having some issues. Um, Henry had some issues. He started throwing up, and uh, so the doctor asked him. So when the boy was throwing up, was he like retching, like really difficulty throwing up, or was it more natural? Like it just all just came out very easily. And um, he sat there and he, he said 
you know, that question from the doctor is very specific. Like, <laughs> are there a different way of, of, of throwing up? I thought, you know, like people throw up, they just throw up, you know. But um, he said, no, it's just very natural. It doesn't seem like he was, um, you know, having then discomfort. It's just he couldn't hold the food down. And so then the doctor um, looked at him, very concerned, trying to find, he's like, the doctor is like trying to find words. And then so he was, you know, being a comedian that he is, he's like, you know, so what does he have? Like, does he have cancer? And then uh, the doctor looked at him very gravely and said, you know, you said it. Yeah, I'm glad that you said it and not me. So uh, they found out that, you know, he had a very specific condition. Um, there is a tumor, aggressive growing tumor growing at the, at the base of the spine. And uh, that, uh, you know, statistically, that's um, pretty much meant death, particularly for boys, um, young infant boys. Um, so, um, Time goes by, and the boy did die about nine months after that. And, um, you know, the interview goes on, but um, I think it um, sort of captures the other side of life, where um, the Christmas shoe captures the love from a child to a parent. Um, this particular story captures the affection that a parent have for a child and um, you know so these kind of things um, plays out in each one of our lives uh, in this particular story here before us uh, captures a the emotion the affection that a, a sister a sibling have for a brother um, and uh, it always talk about lost it talks about the things that we will lose in life, and it talks about how dear it is when we lose those things. And it gives, um, it, it allows us to peer into the heart of God, um, where he allows all these things to happen in front of us, to us, uh, around us, to show to us how dear we are to him when we are lost to him, I believe. And um, through these particular messages, through these particular stories, we see what it is that God is willing to let go of, to be able to bring us back to him, to make sure that we are found when we are lost, to make sure that we are brought back into the house of God when we have gone astray. Um, it speaks about the, the emotion, and it's not just the emotion, and I think about it logically um, as I'm just going through all these stories and going through this particular message. And I thought to myself, so um, my son was born not too long ago, about six weeks ago. I know six weeks ago because I have to go back to work tomorrow <laughs> because my six, six weeks leave is up. <laughs> um, he was born six weeks ago, and... Um, you know, I've always, I, I sat down and I think about it, and I said, what has this boy done for me? He hasn't given me anything. He hasn't showered me with gifts. He hasn't shown any emotion toward me at all. The only thing that he has ever given me are dirty diapers and, you know, earfuls of screams and whatever it is, and wrath whenever I'm not feeding him quickly enough or too quickly. He hasn't done anything for me beneficially. And yet, I can't help but feel this weird feeling. Like, I need to hold him. I need to make sure he's OK. I need to, whatever it is. Maybe we have a word for it called love. But I think that it is just a small fraction of what it is that God feels for each one of us. Because while my son cannot talk, cannot express anything, cannot do anything on his own, he can't, he can't even crawl yet, right? So there is nothing lovable about him at all because he hasn't done anything for me. In the season of gift giving and gift receiving, he hasn't really given me anything useful, right? <laughs> and so it's, it's difficult for me to say I love him because he has done something for me. And so too is true is that 
We haven't done anything for God that deserves His love. There is never anything that we can ever do for God that will ever be like, oh, I, God loves you because you have done X, Y, and Z. There is no, nothing that we can ever do that would approach that. And yet, when we see here in verse number 35, it says that Jesus wept. And if we went back and went, go forward a few verses back and a few verses forward, we see that there is a full range of things that bring him to this emotion where there is only two words, Jesus wept. The entirety of Jesus' emotion is in the fact that we are going through difficulties in our lives, and we are losing things in our lives. And we're losing precious things in our lives. And he understands that. But it too reflects what it is that God is losing. And it is souls. It is us. Jesus wept because he can feel. If we go back and just read that, verse 35 says that Jesus wept. But if we go back a little bit, we can see why he did it. Verse number 33 said, when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in the spirit and trouble. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see, Lord. They replied, and he wept. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could he not have, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man kept this man from dying. Verse number 38, Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. We can see here that John wants to capture not what happened, but he is capturing the emotion that Jesus is expressing. He is moved whenever we are in pain. He is moved whenever we are at loss. And we are at loss the most when we have lost something so deep and so meaningful to each one of us. And that deeply moving thing that we have lost is something that maybe no one else understands. We can't express it to someone else to understand it. I am moved when I'm, I'm, I'm hearing these stories and these, um, these songs on the radio, but I can never understand what it is to lose a child because I haven't done it. I can't say to God that I understand what it is to lose a child the same way that God has lost his own son because of us. And even if my son had died in the NICU, he would have not been, have been able to save anyone. If I had lost my son, he would have done nothing for any of you or me or anyone else on this earth. He would have changed nothing at all. Rob Deloney, as, 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 as powerful as that story may be, and as moving as it is to be listening to Henry passing away and wondering what else can be done, his passing didn't bring any changes to any of us. It didn't benefit. It didn't impact us in any way. Only the Son of God, Jesus Christ, when he died, brought something for everyone on this earth. We can see that God is not just someone who is out there floating in the ether or whatever it is that is out there. Unmoved, not impacted, unchanged by the things that we go through. He is very much connected and being impacted by every joy and every sorrow that we go through. But it is because he wants us to also understand how much he is losing when his children do not come home to him. Every soul that is not going back to him is lost. And there is deep pain, I believe, that God feels. His breath never returning to him. The life force that he has breathed into 
a particular person does not come back to him. A part of him is shredded, torn, and is gone forever from him. And I believe that that is the very thing that is lost to God when we do not return to him. I would just run back to the beginning here a little bit, and I just want to go through. Sometimes, sometimes we feel like God is distant because he doesn't come right away. The answer doesn't come immediately. The things that we are feeling so much pain, you listen to what I'm saying, you're like, you know, God feels everything that we feel. He understands us. How come he is so delayed in responding to me? How come I don't get any answers at all? In verse number four, when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness would not end in death. No, it is for God's glory so that God's son may be glorified through it. In verse number five, it says, now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So, because of his love, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Because there is something much more fundamental than our pain. And it is that God has a plan in place for everything that happens to us and around us and for us. The things that we lost, the things that we gained, Paul said it very eloquently, everything we have, we have received. There is nothing that we have that we have not received. Our eye colors, our hair color, our height, our, you know, diseases or health, our abilities or the lack thereof is all written in our DNA. The script that is already written there is being expressed over time into the person that we become. Everything is scripted and moving along in its path because God has written it that way. Now Jesus loved Martha and his, her sister and Lazarus. So he, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed there. He stayed where he was two more days. There is no delay in God's plan. Matter of fact, if we go all the way to the end of this very long chapter, thank you, Thomas, for reading this very long chapter. But this is what it said toward the end. Um, if you would read with me from verse number 45 on now. After Lazarus was called from the tomb, he came out from the dead. Verse number 45, Therefore many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary had seen what Jesus has done, believed in him. But some of them went to the Pharisee and told him what Jesus has done. Then the chief priests and the Pharisee called a meeting of the Sanhedrin. What are we accomplishing, he, they asked. What are we doing about this? Here's this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, everyone will believe in him, and then the Romans will come and take away both our temples and our nation. What do we lose to stand? Uh, what do we stand to lose in all of this? What will we be losing? What precious things will we be losing if we uh, allow this person to move on and continue to do what they're doing? What will we stand to lose? It's always a question about what am I going to give up? What am I going to be? What things are going to be taken away from me in this life? And they decided that, they decided nothing. Because in verse number 49, it says this. Then one of them named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. Do you not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than the whole nation perish? And then the explanation. Verse number 51, he did not say this on his own, but as high priest of the year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for the, that nation, but also for the scattered children of God to bring them together and make them one. So from that day, they plotted to take his life. This is the beginning of the end for Jesus. Because 
Before this point, there was no plot to kill him. No, there, there, was, there, there are people that wanted to kill him <laughs> individually. But there was no collective plan that says, let's go after this guy. There was no, like, you know, like the FBI most wanted list being generated for Jesus, right? But at this point, there was one. At this point, they decided that he needed to die for the betterment of everyone. And that was not something that they thought of. It wasn't something that people thought of. It was something that God had written, decreed that it must happen. Verse number 51, he did not say this on his own, but uh, as high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the Jewish nation. And not only for that nation, but also for the scattered children of, of God. To bring them together and make them one. To bring them home. The purpose of God is always, has always been to bring us all home. And that is the same message that Paul had given. I would just point to one other story. If you have, uh, please go to Luke chapter 8 with me. Because there was once a time where the Jews, as, as they're not homogeneous in, in the Bible at all, there were groups that didn't have this kind of emotions or didn't have this sort of apathy toward him, toward Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 8, number, verse number 40 on out says this. Now when Jesus returned, a, a crowd welcomed him. For they were all expecting him. They weren't, they weren't looking to kill him <laughs> at this point in time. Because he, he had done a lot of miracles. He had given out a lot of different things. Verse number four, 41. Then a man named Jairus, a synagogue leader, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl about 12, was dying. We all run to God when there is a need. We all run to God wanting something from God when there is something that we are about to lose grip off. There's something that is about to fall out of our hands and we want it, God to help us to hold on to it. As Jesus was on the way, the crowd almost crushed him. I'm think, when I'm reading this, I'm thinking of what happened you know, around uh, Halloween in, in South Korea, where there's a group of people and just, just smashing together and 150 people died, losing a lot of lives. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Then Jesus said, who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus says, Someone touch me. When we are in so much pain, when we have so much sorrow, when we reach out and we want it to touch the rope of God, he does feel it. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet in the presence of the people, and she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. And if you were to read on in this, you will see that Lazarus being raised from the dead is not the first time. In fact, Jesus raised this child of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, 12 years old daughter, raised her from the dead. But that that didn't precipitate anyone wanting to kill him because that wasn't in God's timing. It is so important for us that it isn't so much as for me to go out there and say, you need to believe in God. It isn't for me to go out there and say, you will be damned if you don't believe in God. All of it is true. The pressing matter is that they're all lost. 
They're all orphaned. They're all trying to reach out to different things, to feel comforted, to feel loved, to feel like they're at home. And they can never be until they reach out and reach the helm of Jesus, as this woman did. No one can help them. We will continue to bleed. The image in my mind is that she's losing her life force. Blood is what gives us life, and she is continuously just losing it. And there is no way of stopping it. It just continues to just flow out of her. Life sometimes is like it's draining. It just flow out of us, and we don't know how to keep on going. And we just need some sort of a stoppage of the loss that we feel. The loss of energy, the loss of love, the loss of the things that brings us joy. We feel nothing but sorrow of losing every moment of our lives. Whether it be our jobs, our family, our loved one, whatever it is, there are things that we go through in this life that pulls us away from the place that we ought to be. It's not, it's not some paradise in Mexico or Hawaii. I'm not talking about that. You know, we can be sitting here and it's raining and it's cold and we're like, I wish I was like in the tropics somewhere, you know, bathing in the sun and you know, taking in the wind and the surf and the seawater and things like that. That's not the paradise. Paradise is to be in so much pain and then to be comforted in that pain. We see this image a little bit and um, let's just go back to John chapter, we were at in 11, let's go to 12. Let's go to 12 to see, to see when it is that when we are being touched by God, what it looks like. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus lived, whom Jesus has raised from the dead. He's very specific, John. You want to make sure that we are very clear on what he's talking about. Here a dinner was given in Jesus', Jesus uh, uh, honor. Martha served while Lazarus was among those reclining at the table with him. Then Mary took about a pint of pure nard, an expensive perfume. She poured it on Jesus' feet and wipe his feet with her hair. Oftentimes I would read this and I was like, I don't know why she did this. Maybe she was forgiven of some sin or something. But it is because I have short-term memory loss. I didn't re really remember what happened in chapter 11. Jesus recovered something so dear to her that was lost to her. And she thought that she would have lost her brother forever. Irredeemable. Nothing could have pulled this thing that she lost from her, ever. And yet he did. So there is not anything in this world that she would not offer up for him. It is, we, we read on and we understand more that there is a plan in place because God has designed it. He did it, she did, she poured the oil on, and Jesus said it in verse number seven, leave her alone, Jesus replied. It was intended that she should save this perfume for the day of my burial. When we look at the image of Lazarus being entombed in this cave with a stone rolled onto its mouth, covering it. And Lazarus walking out, that's the image, exact image of what it is that Jesus would eventually do after the cross. That he would also have the stone rolled out and he would emerge from that tomb. But the difference between him and Lazarus is that when he walked out of that tomb, and we will celebrate that in four months time, is that he carried with him all of our death all of our sickness and took it all away. He removed every losses that we could possibly feel on this earth. 
if we would only reach out to him. There, there was a song that the worship team sang earlier. Thank you for that. For every Lazarus that are out there, Jesus would call all of us out of the tomb. Every moment that we have a Lazarus moment, every loss that we have ever suffered in our lives, that have no answers for, Jesus would answer that for us. He would be able to call that death back for us if we would reach out to him. This is the reason why we ought to tell others about Jesus. It's because, not because someday they will go to heaven. That's true. But it is because in this moment right now when they're in need, in this season right now, in this winter, where there is cold and death and suffering and losses also all around us, there is only one person with the answer. There's only one person with the power to call the dead back to life, and that is Jesus. And he does it not for any reason, but he does it because he loves deeply for each one of us. We go through these seasons of losses. We experience so many different things. In the interview, Rob Delaney says that among those people that have experienced losses, particularly he's with a, with a, a group of people who have lost their children, a support group. They seem to have a special language, which they all communicate. And it's not because they use different words. The words are all the same. But it conveys a difference in the way that they are able to talk about it. Because they have all gone through the same thing. They have lost something irrecoverable, irretrievable, meaningful, deep. And because of those losses, they're able to understand each other. God, too have lost great, significant, deep, emotional things. Souls, yours, mine, all of those out there. He understand losses. He understand grief. His own son died for us. That's why he is able to comprehend, understand, comfort. And not only that, bring us joy. Bring us hope. Bring us love when we need it the most. I experienced that recently, and this is more of a testimony. When I was sitting in that room in the hospital, kind of wondering, you know, what are the possibility? You know, I, I like to I, I like to play probability. I asked the doctor, so what is the probability? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what's the probability of me walking out up here, you know, with my child? And um, you know, probability didn't help. <laughs> Because I didn't, I didn't like to hear anything other than 100%, right? <laughs> you, you, you don't want to go gambling where everybody says you, you have a 100% chance of losing. You, you're like, no, I'm not, I'm not for that at all. I'm not gambling in that one. Um, but in the midst of all of that, I still remember um, that no matter what happened, God's got me. That whether in life or in death, there's a reason for it. And there is, in this chapter 11 of John, it speaks about that, that everything is for God's glory. And what that really means for me is that in everything, it should demonstrate to each one of us how much God loves each one of us, that he cares deeply about each one of us. And that, to me, it's such an encouraging and hopeful thing for me in a moment where I'm a little bit lost. And I hope that you know, each one of us would find that, 
when we are in moments of losses, when we are in moments of grief, when we are in moments of pain, when we are in moments of sorrow. I hope and I pray that we would be able to reach out to the helm of Jesus and that the things, the flowing of our life force that flows out of us would stop and that we would be healed of our suffering. No, we do not believe in Jesus so that someday we go to heaven. Yes, it's true. But we believe in Jesus because he loves us and he can touch us and heal us today. In this moment, in those moments of pains and sorrow. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for you are not a God at a distance. We thank you, Lord, because you are a God that feels us, that you care for us, that you love us, that you embrace us. In our moments of need, in our moments of sorrow, you are always right there beside us. Lord, I pray that you would allow us to move out of here, Lord, and to be able to proclaim your love to the nations, to all those people who have yet to experience, understand your heart. We pray that you would give us the courage. You give us the testimonies, the stories of how you have came and saved us. We thank you, Lord, and we pray that you would allow us to walk through every dark alleys, knowing that you are always right beside us. We thank you, Lord, and we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.